which I do want to comment on is that uh, although much of the lectures that you get in this course are out of the textbook, um, between among the three of us, myself and Allie and Cleaver, each one of us has her own specialty, and we will tend to wax long and lengthy on our own particular type of work. Mine, for example, has to be, happens to be fertilizer and soils. Uh, Dr. Allie will be talking to you next on propagation, grafting, bench grafting, the various types of propagation. And then in the spring quarter, Dr. Cleaver, who is with us this afternoon, will be uh, tending to weigh pretty heavily on photosynthesis and carbohydrate nutrition. So over this afternoon, you're going to get the, the load on fertilizers. And we'll have two lectures of this, the one this afternoon and another one later on. Now, we want, I'd like to approach this from about, we'll give you an, to give you an outline. Uh, we used to have a publication which we could hand out, but it's out of print now. And even, but most of these uh, publications are these manuscripts or leaflets, which I used to require reading when we had 20 students in the class, and we could hand out the 20 public uh, reprints, or could uh, put a uh, half a dozen on reserve. It wasn't so bad. But when we got 75 students and maybe only six copies of some of these materials, uh, I hesitated a little bit to have you tramp clear across the campus and stand in line to check them out. So uh, to a certain extent, I'm shortening the course a little bit this quarter to avoid having you read or go to that trouble to read some of these publications which we used to require as reading. But there will be a few that you'll have to read um, in spite of everything. But if some of you want references to some of these and want to come to me or to Dr. Alley and get the names and titles, you might be able to go look them up in the library or in some uh, a Journal of American Society of Knowledge or something to read them in more detail. For example, this afternoon there'll be three or four I'll refer to. I mean, I will quote from, but I won't refer to unless you would like to have them. You can see me after class and get them. But what we're going to talk about is from a leaflet which I had published before in which we talked about the mineral elements, the mineral elements, uh, Require, required for or in excess by uh, with great vineyards in California. And what it really boils down to is we have nitrogen and potassium among the so-called macro elements. Macro elements, meaning that they're needed in large amounts. And we have zinc and boron which are the micronutrients needed in small amounts, of course, micronutrients or microelements. And most of all, I'm going to talk about for this afternoon and next time in the afternoon concerns only these four elements. We will touch on sodium. On, we will touch on sodium, chloride, and boron as toxicity elements, tox toxic elements in California vineyards, but not, not too heavily. So in a nutshell, this sums up the whole mineral nutrition story in California, that we do have deficiencies of nitrogen and potassium, we have deficiencies of zinc, we have deficiencies as well as toxicities of boron, and we have toxic comp amounts of sodium and chloride. So that's what the next four lectures are going to be on, two this afternoon and two next time. But when we get around to this matter of discussing nitrogen, we have quite a big feel, and this will take mostly a, a, an hour, because the first thing we want to talk about is, is cover crops. And then as a subdivision under that, organic matter of whatever form that you want to discuss or think about. So for the moment, we want to talk about cover crops and organic matter. Now I can sum it up, I can give you the summary sentence first, and then we'll talk about it for 30 minutes. That from the work that has been done on tree crops in pomology department, 
and to a lesser extent the work that's been done in, on grapes, we can say that uh, cover crops in California are useful only under one of two conditions, two conditions, either on hillsides where you have erosion problems or in the central San Joaquin Valley where you have water penetration problems. Because, strange as it may seem, in some of these soils which appear to be quite sandy and which you think would, uh, water would go down through like going through a sieve, the water will stand on, for example, in our Kearney field station. Believe it or not, by repeated accurate records, we get water penetration at the rate of one-tenth of an inch per hour. And that's almost the rate at which water evaporates from a pan. So the question really comes up, is the water going down or are you just kidding yourself when you irrigate? And I've got some experiments going on down there to try to prove this. For example, vineyards in which I'm not putting on any water at all after the uh, bud break time. And last year, at least, it didn't show any effect as compared to uh, across the avenue where they put water on. And it stands so long. See, it'll stand for three days or four days before it goes in or evaporates that they've got seashells growing there, ocean, <laughs> <laughs> ocean. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> so I don't know uh, whether water's going in or whether we're just creating an artificial salt and sea in some of those areas. But it's strange that this soil structure of the type that we have with this rather sandy soil can so close in and seal off that water can't go down. And of course, some of this is said to be due and is due to a small amount of sodium that gets into the soil or it comes into the water or is in the soil to start with and tends to uh, uh, cause a sealing problem. I don't know whether we should take time to go into that at all or not, but, and I haven't in the other classes, but, or the other sections, but just to give you a real touch, a slight touch of soil chemistry, which we'll touch on a little bit later, if you've got a micro particle of, of clay with its negative charges on it, and if you have uh, uh, quite a bit of sodium in the soil, sodium uh, ion is a, a relatively small ion. It's only, it only has atomic weight of 23 and a, a single positive valence. But it has unique property that it can, when it gets a chance, it can put on a big shell of very highly, uh, very tightly held water. So that if you have a soil that's fairly high in sodium, and you get, and then it swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks because these, these layers of water around the sodium disappear. And then when you put on water, they swell up and they just act in essence like gelatin. And you can imagine putting water down through gelatin. It just won't go. So what you have to do in some cases like this is, is to treat the soil with gypsum. I'm off my subject already, but with gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, and calcium has a double valence, which means that it sticks closer to the soil particle because you've got more energy involved tying it into that soil particle. But on the other hand, it has a smaller shell of water. So that if you can put on some gypsum and knock off some of these big swell toed <laughs> uh, sodiums and flush them out at the bottom and replace them with some of these more closely, tightly held calcium, then you get a better water penetration. Does that follow? You got that? Is that fairly clear or mixed up? Anyway, that's the whole idea of putting on gypsum to increase water penetration. And uh, it's also the, the principle involved where you see soils that swell and crack, swell and crack, and make big cracks when they tend to dry out. They're usually fairly high in sodium because the sodium expands quite a bit with all this added water around, a water shell around it when it's wet. And then when the water disappears, of course, it shrinks down to nothing. So it's this shrinkage and swellage of individual molecules that gives you this big cracking of soils. Okay, I don't know how we got off on that subject. But anyway, um, we, were, we, we started in to talk about cover crops. And uh, I said that, uh, that cover crops are useful for water penetration. That's how we got into this. And uh, 
for erosion. Well, erosion should be fairly simple and clear and, and quite easily understood. It's just a matter of water penetration with cover crops. Well, if you've got soils in that tend to seal up because of, of excess sodium or breakdown of soil structures, and then you plant a lot of, of cover crops very close together with a lot of root systems, whether it's on the surface or whether it's down here in what you might refer to six or eight inches down, six or eight inches deep to the, what we refer to as a plow pan where you have a compacted layer through which uh, water doesn't penetrate very well, but you get lots of roots going through it from this cover crop. And then when you mow off this cover crop and work it under, and the, and the roots die off, then you've got a whole lot of, of little canals or channels made through this hard pan, which allow water to go through it. So that's the other, that's the other reason why we would have cover crops, to increase water penetration. But we would not, under California conditions, plant cover crop in vineyards or orchards to increase the organic matter content for several reasons. First, it's true that if you have a lot of organic matter, we can raise this now, if you have the surface of the soil and you've got this cover crop that you've planted here uh, and you work it under and, this rip, and you plow it under and this represents a six inch depth, let's say, that's true that you make a very nice tilt, tilt condition on this top six inches. But your grapevine is standing here with its root system down here, hopefully because you forced it down there. Uh, maybe the main root system down here is 24 inches, 24 to 30 inches deep. Now what do these roots down in here know about what you've done up here in the top six inches? They don't even know that you did anything. Sure, you've, you've made a nice tilt condition and you probably aided the water penetration from this example I just gave you over there. But except for that, uh, the nice tilt condition that you've got on this top six inches, making it plow easier, break up easier and so forth, uh, doesn't affect the roots of this grapevine down here. Mm -hmm. Don't the uh, nutrients well, I'll get to that in a moment when we talk about cover crop here. But right now, I'm trying to lay the groundwork for just exactly what you're asking for. Okay, so here's the situation on that. And then some people say, well, don't plants like to have organic matter? Don't they need it? And I can tell you that I've grown grapes out there alongside the winter vine in those tanks for five or six years at a time and nothing but road gravel, the same stuff that they put on top of the tar it's about a quarter inch in diameter to, uh, to uh, prepare the road surface and I've grown it in that exact material which I've ordered from the gravel companies that supply to the highway department and I've grown them for five years at a time without ever one particle organic matter in there, just putting the chemicals in nutrient solution and pumping it over once a day. So where do people get this wonderful idea that vines have to have organic matter? No plant has to have organic matter. Maybe an orchid does since it grows. <laughs> But uh, I, I think you could fix up an artificial medium meme for it. And why am I harping on this so much? Well, there are French vineyards in which they, they believe this so religiously that they, keep even, they even maintain herds of horses to get horse manure to put on the vineyards. The main reason for maintaining these herds of horses is just for the manure to put on their vineyards because they think it's wonderful and they need it. It's a lot of horse manure. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be on the TV, too. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, one thing I always like to stop and, and explain is, well, then why have you heard all this business? Gee, people tell me to make, keep a mulch pot in their corner in the backyard and put it on my garden and all this business, and it makes nice fertilizer, and it makes for that, and so forth. Well, if you're talking about annual crops, and we're talking about this six inch depth, you plow this, you take this uh, 
mulch that you put on or this uh, cover crop that you grow and you plow it under, plow depth, six inches deep or so. And then a month or two later, you come along and you plant seeds right here and right here and right here. And then they grow and they start to grow in this nice organic, uh, nice tilt condition, light soil and so forth. And that's something else because they start out with their root systems up in, in this shallow area that you've cultivated. But we deliberately, as I say, try to get all of our grapefruits and so forth down below this so that we don't even, we're not even involved in that. But if you're talking about annual crops, that's something else. So that with trees and orchards, say, we don't get any, gain any, we don't gain any benefit uh, from other than increasing the water penetration. Now the question was raised, well, what about uh, fertilizer? Okay, now we go to cover crops. And we have, generally in California, about two or three or four general types of cover crops. We have uh, just plain barley, which I'm talking now about the planted ones. We, these are planted. Perhaps they should have gone the other way and put natural first, but these are planted. We can have barley alone, which you see often. We can have barley plus vetch, and vetch is a legume, which if you were prepared for this course, you know that a legume uh, fixes nitrogen on its root system through those nodules and so forth. So it fixes nitrogen on the root system. Or you can have other types of legumes. You can have a... Uh, do you really need the legumes or do you just actually need the, uh, the fixing nitrogen? The bacteria grows in the, uh, the nodules. Well, what plants are you going to have? I'm just wondering if you uh, can just use the bacteria and maybe the bacteria would grow on the, the vine itself rather than growing on the legume. <laughs> it won't grow, it has to grow on a legume, okay. So it has to be a legume for it to grow on. You got a good point there in a way, but it has to be a legume because that's the nature of a legume. Or you can have a... Another type of legume, which you'll see quite often, is something called horse beans. It's sort of a, a broadleaf type plant that you see, and it's also a legume which will fix nitrogen. So you say, well, this legume and this vetch and these horse beans will fix nitrogen, and uh, that gives me some free nitrogen. So why don't I plant cover crop? Well, let's see how free it is, okay? All right, in order to plant either one of these, to plant, let's forget barley, and just assume one of these, uh, all you have to do, you know, is to uh, buy the seed, which will cost you about anywhere from, let's say, the seed alone will cost you anywhere from 3 to $5. I don't know what it is now in the price of inflation, but about 3 to $5 per acre for the seed. Hmm? And then you have to prepare the seed bed, so you've got to go through that, your vineyard with a tractor and disc it, even ever so roughly. And that costs a little money. I was thinking on the way over, walking over here to the office, that some of you don't realize, one of the exam, exam questions I was going to give you involved some of my trips down to Kern County last week, but they have many, many, many blocks down there that are square mile, 640 acres one square mile. Have you ever stopped to think, and you haven't, how many miles a tractor has to drive to cultivate a, a square mile? Well, let, see, there's, this is 5,200 and some odd feet. Let's say over 5,000 feet. And if you got a row every 10 feet, you only drive 500 miles to square elevated section at, at less than five miles per hour. That gives you a lot of time to contemplate your navel. <laughs> <laughs> Over 500 miles. Have you ever stopped to think about that? So that uh, to first then, then you're going to have to uh, cultivate, say, before that 500 miles to the square mile blows my mind <laughs> sometimes <laughs> to think that you have to drive that far on a tractor to cultivate a section. So then, so then you've got the seed, so you've got to cultivate this business, which you can't run a tractor today for less probably than $5 per acre. And then you've got to seed it. 
you got to put the seed in, so you've got a seed, a seed operation, let's call it. And then under some conditions down the valley, you might have to irrigate. And then in the spring, you've got to go through and turn it under. And then under, turn under in the spring. So you do all those operations. And uh, this seed operation will probably cost you, if this costs you $5 to do this, this is certainly going to cost you, let's say, $3 an acre. And then irrigate, what's that going to cost you? Maybe $5 an acre, if you, if you have to. But we'll put a question mark on that. And then you've got to go through and turn it under, and that may be fairly expensive. That may be 5 to $10, depending on how, how big, big the cover crop is. So you're adding up to 5 10 15 18 over $20 an acre involved in this deal in cost so far. But we're going to get some nitrogen out of this. Let's see how much. Well, I can give you the, the references and so on to show you some work that was done by the people working with sugar beets in which they took a straight, complete, uniform acreage planting of a vetch, 100% vetch. And they let the vetch go all the way through to seed, to the seed stage. And, we've all, and they had already found out that this, this legume, this uh, bacteria fixing the nitrogen doesn't do much. Or you don't get much fixation of nitrogen with vetch until you let it go at least to the flowering stage, flowering and seed stage. In those early stages when it's fairly young, it doesn't, it doesn't fix much nitrogen. So by letting this vetch go to the 100% seed stage and a complete solid planting, and then testing the, re testing the results of it with, with uh, sugar beet plantings, they found that they got the equivalent of a response of 100 pounds, 100 pounds of N per acre. That was their response from a solid planting allowed to go to the seed stage. But remember the seed stage, flowering seed stage is where they got most of the nitrogen. So let's say then, uh, I think I show you this in the publication, that if you plow this under back at the time you have to in, in great culture, you might get 50 pounds. You might get 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre and a solid planting. But grapes, you can't plant it in solid planting. You've got vines here and vines over here and vines over here. And you either plant a four-foot strip, a four-foot strip, or perhaps a six-foot strip. Some, some people might put a six-foot in, but more commonly it's a four-foot strip. And the vines are planted 12 feet apart. So if we're going to go with this idea of the sea shade, then we cut this 50 pounds into a third, which gives us 17 pounds of nitrogen. Hmm? So this gives us 17 pounds, theoretically, 17 pounds of nitrogen per acre from this cover crop that all we had to do is do all this for. And even at today's high prices, you can buy that 17 pounds of nitrogen, certainly for 20 cents a pound, which is $3.40. And what did we say over there, $20? So you got a lot of free nitrogen, didn't you? <laughs> You can buy it out of the bag and spread it on this afternoon for 20 cents a pound and get, and get uh, whatever benefit you're getting out from a fertilizer out of that cover crop for $3.40 versus $20. One time I was sitting in an old farmer's home down in Madera County and giving him this speech while we had a, some of his homemade wine or something and he said, you know, I was going to put on cover crop on my vineyard this fall or next month, but he said, you just changed my mind. I'm going to use that money to buy a Cadillac. That was back before the gas shortage, so he bought a Cadillac instead and, and, and forgot the nitrogen bit. At least he said he was going to. So you see, to get back to the question that somebody asked, don't you have some nutrients percolating down? What nutrients you got percolating down? A little bit of nitrogen which you can put on a whole lot cheaper out of the bag. But I'm not through yet. I'm going to hit you over the head again. Uh, 
One of the things about nitrogen, which I'll end up this whole afternoon's lecture on, is that with deciduous type crops, which have this so-called grand period of growth in which you get a very rapid rate of growth at early in the spring. This is growth in now per day, growth per day. And in the early spring from bud break up until about bloom time with apples and pears and grapes and so forth, this very early period here is referred to as a grand period of growth. You'll see that in textbooks and so on. And in order to get this grand period of growth, you want to have lots of nitrogen in the root zone. Um, actually, with tree crops and vines, you want the high amount of nitrogen back here just as the buds begin to break, just as they begin to grow. You want to have lots of nitrogen in the root zone because here's where the big demand is going to come. Then you want it to taper off. If you had your real ideals, if you could have your druthers, your druther have... Uh, this very high supply of nitrogen very early in the season up until about bloom time. And then if you could, you put a vacuum on this and wipe the nitrogen out completely. That's the rate of growth, but you would have the nitrogen drop off like that. Once you get the leaf growth, the leaf surface there, then you'd like to cut it off and then just take care of the leaves. And this is one of the questions that's come up before. Growers always want to know what fertilizer to put on and everything. They'll stand out there with the leaf hoppers going every which way so that you can't even see. And the red spider's walking off with the vines. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? And then they say, what, fer what fertilizer can I put on to uh, increase the sugar? <laughs> and I tell them, for crying out loud, just wipe out these leaf hoppers and the red spider and cut off the fertilizer and keep take care of the leaves that you got. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's what they can't seem to understand. They want to put on more and more and more growth. But the reason you want this growth to cut off, see, is that the grapevine is a vine. And a vine will continue to grow so long as you give it warm temperature and water and nitrogen. And when it continues to grow, it's going to use up the carbohydrate that the leaves are producing, the sugar that the leaves are producing. What you like to do is get enough leaves out there to act as a factory and then stop them from growing any further. Don't let any more growth go into producing more leaves, which you're going to prune off next winter anyway. But make the leaves that are there, keep them healthy, and let them produce sugar to go into the grapes. Now that seems to be a very little simple principle that seems to be very hard to get across. To produce enough leaves, remember I told you you need 10 square centimeters of leaves to produce a gram of grapes. And once you get enough leaf surface, if you'll take care of it and stop the leaf growth, or the shoot growth beyond that, using up energy and sugar, which you don't need, into new growth, but instead stop it some way, and put it into the fruit, then you'd have an ideal condition. But you can't do this under most, con most uh, vineyard situations. That's why I told you the other day when I was telling you about growing emperors, that on the shallow soil that they have over there and around by Salem and so on, they can control the water and nutrients quite a bit because they're growing them in a bathtub. They, they have an underground sidewalk about three feet down, and they can run out of water by letting cover crop grow and suck out the water, suck out the nitrogen and so on, so that you can taper off that growth real fast in the fall, the growth real fast in the fall, and let the sugar that's being produced go into the grapes. And that's part of the whole business of cultivating grapes. Okay, so uh, then, then this is, this then, we're talking about this growth per day, and this is early in the season, and this is bud break. and this might be up to about bloom or a little bit after bloom, then you want them to slow down in growth. And this was nitrogen that I was really trying to show here. This is, but, but uh, growth will taper off like this. But the more rapid you can taper off that growth after you get sufficient growth. Remember, I told you you had to have a little carbohydrate accumulation or to have uh, flower buds form. And that this takes place about bloom time. And, of course, after that, you'd like growth to slow down so that you can get the sugar that's being produced going into the fruit. 
Okay, what's this got to do with nitrogen and cover crop? Well, um, we want this nitrogen in the root zone of the grape, ready to be absorbed by the roots, just as buds break or swell or broaten. Yeah, okay. And then we would like to taper it off. But we've got cover crop. This is a legume cover crop that we only paid $20 for when we could have bought it for three and a half. So uh, we've got that in there. But we plowed it under back here about bud break time. And it takes about two months for it to decompose. Because when that is decomposing, uh, it has uh, bacterial action going on to break down all of this plant tissue to break down to, to release the nitrogen. And you can't, you can't have all, all potatoes and no meat. So this, uh, these soil organisms have to have some nitrogen go along with their potatoes, with their carbohydrate. So they're going to scrounge around and, and, and use up every bit of nitrogen within the area in which their roots or their tops are involved in order to go through this decay process. Right during this time when the vine would like to have it too. Then when they use up all this food and, and go through all this process, uh, decomposing process and, and uh, finally break down and begin to die themselves and release the nitrogen to the plants, that's over here about this time, of, about this period. Now all of a sudden we've got a dose of nitrogen. But do we want it here? Here's where we'd like to have the growth start to slow down. All of a sudden we're going to give them a shot of nitrogen. So we not only paid about four times what we should have for the nitrogen, we're going to get the nitrogen delivered uh, nearly two months late. Now, I think I made that sermon strong enough. <laughs> so, so getting nitrogen out of a legume cover crop is a real waste of time and money. Okay? Does anybody have a sheep of in there anymore? So they have to, I mean, you're not putting a cover crop down, so you want to clean out the vegetation you've got. Just plant the cover crop and then sheep it. Well, you, well, well, you couldn't do it in the spring. See, now we sheep. Uh, I'll tell you later on in the lecture after the next that this is a good idea to sheep in the late fall, or not a good idea, but it's good economy in countries where food is scarce. But if you put sheep into a young vineyard with shoots out this long, they'd eat the grapes and, and forget the <laughs> cover crop. So, so we can't do anything. So, uh, cover crop. Uh, really, the organic matter aspect of the cover crop doesn't help you much, and the uh, cover crop doesn't do you much good from the standpoint of a, a, a cheap source of nitrogen. And it involves a lot of operations and expensive operations, and not the least of which is this idea of irrigating late in the fall when you're putting in the cover crop, because you could possibly stimulate some late vine growth, which would cause the buds might break and push out and cause you some frost damage, which we'll discuss Wednesday. So uh, just the cost of irrigation alone is not the only problem here. So uh, we just do not recommend that. OK, but you're still an organic farmer. So uh, OK, I can't use cover crop, but I'm going to use manure or something like that. OK, let's, let's go to manure, uh, because you want organic matter. One of the basic principles of of soil, of soil courses, I guess, or of a soil course, was one of the, is one put out by Professor Yenny at Berkeley, in a reference I can give you, which he worked, I guess it was his PhD thesis at uh, Missouri, is that uh, whether or not you can have soil organic matter held at a relatively high rate in a soil depends upon two main factors, and that is the temperature of the climate and the uh, rainfall or humidity or the combination of the two, rainfall dash humidity and temperature. And he worked uh, east and west, I guess, but mainly north and south to show that the farther north you went from Missouri, uh, the cooler it got, the higher the humidity got, and the higher you, the uh, native organic matter was in the soil. But what I want to Want you to want you to put down in a sentence as sort of a general summary of about 150 pages of his work is that it is quite difficult to increase or the soil organic matter 
above that which existed in the native soil. That is quite difficult to increase the organic matter above that which existed in the native soil. Now, a lot of you have been out in the desert and stomped around the mountains and what have you, and how much organic matter do you think there is in the native California soil? Pretty low. Maybe something like two-tenths of a percent compared to maybe 20 percent in some of these uh, prairie soils of, the, of Iowa and uh, North and South Dakota and so on, where they had the buffalo grass and it had decayed and, and accumulated for a period of a thousand years so that when the farmers came in there to plant corn and so on, they moved into this beautiful, rich, organic soil and planted corn and immediately burned it out. But because the environment, the temperature and the relative humidity and so forth of those areas are such as they are, you can go in with rotating crops and build back the organic matter quite a bit. If the native organic matter was 10 or 15 percent and you burn it out to practically nothing by planting corn on it for 20 years, you can go and plant soybeans or some such business as this and, and put in a cover crop and rather quickly bring it back to another 5 or 6 or 10 percent because of the environment in which you're located. You can bring it back close to what it was. I mean, you, it isn't too hard to build back toward it. But if you come to California and try to plant a cover crop in a, in a vineyard soil that ran about uh, less than a half a percent organic matter and you're going to try to build it up to two percent, man, you're climbing one of those hills where you take two steps up and fall back to because you can build it up for a month but you can't build it up for much longer than that. Now let me give you an example, one that really I think maybe go home if they haven't thrown all the stuff away. You've been out there pruning grapevines you did for a few weeks and you pruned off a lot of stuff like that and all we do is break it we just go through with a chopper and break it up in chunks yet you didn't have to stumble around over a lot of pieces like that stuff that was left from last year or the year before or the year before that why where'd it go they burned up pretty fast didn't it because you can chew this up with a, with, a, with a disc, you can break it up in pieces like this, and there won't be one particle of this hunk of wood left next year when you go out there. Under our California conditions of high temperature and low humidity and so forth, this stuff disappears in a hurry. How long do you think a nice, luscious piece of, uh, of, of uh, vetch or barley will last? If this disappears in less than a year, how long do you think a piece of barley or vetch plowed under will last? About long enough for you to get the tractor back to the barn, huh? So you're not going to build up organic matter, no matter if you do want organic matter. And there are California conditions, no matter what they may tell you in the Sunday Examiner. Okay, so you're not going to build it up. So organic matter, whether you like it or not, whether you think it's going to benefit or not, you can't build it up under California conditions. You can fight it. But you can put on manure. You can go out and put on a big load of manure and plow it under. And all traces of it will disappear within a month or so under our natural California conditions. Even if you think you need it or want it. So if you're going to go to an organic matter, maybe the thing you ought to put on is uh, uh, pumice, which is what re remains after you squeeze the grapes. It's the skins and seeds after you press skins and seeds, after you press the grapes. And if you have a type of pomace in an area where that you have a seedy type with lots of seeds, then if you're really still committed to organic farming, then this might be your best bet to use pomace because these seeds, in spite of what I just showed you about the wood and how quickly it disappears, apparently if you put them on year after year, it takes a long time for those seeds to break down and decay. They may take a year or two to break down. So if you put it on alternate years or something like that, you can get a continual breakdown of these seeds to give you a slow organic uh, nitrogen uh, NPK supply. Skins, of course, with Thompson seedless, where you have Thompson seedless only. Of course, you don't have any seeds. 
and that breaks down just about as fast as your vetch and barley does. But if you have one that has lots of seeds in it, you can use pomace. And pomace is equivalent, it's equal to a good manure. A good graded manure. By good then I mean one that's been well taken care of, you haven't allowed too much ammonia and so forth to evaporate from it. Okay then, uh, that, that just about wipes out what I might have to say about pomace, cover crop, manure, and what have you. Uh, it's about time for a break, but if, do you have some questions or arguments? I'm always ready for the arguments, okay? Uh, question. Is there any way you can control the uh, turning point for the wood production to uh, fruit production? In this case, yeah. well, of course, the best thing, the way to do that, of course, if you're going to worry about nitrogen, get your nitrogen on early and hopefully get rid of it early. And I'm going to discuss different forms of nitrogen and how to control those after we take a break. But the slowest way to do it would be with organic cover crops, manure, or pomace. Yeah. Uh, some foreign countries will use this list, especially with the loose setting varieties, such as Cabernet or like getting those carbohydrates away from the stems and into the fruit, the fruit bud setting that in one all the reserves of nitrogen and carbohydrates going into the fruit to settle the berries. They'll just top the lines, pour on lots of nitrogen to make them grow real fast and then cut the tops off to stop them from growing. And uh, we don't quite know why, why they do that. Uh, would you have a comment, Dr. Cleaver? For some reason, that uh, work done on the role of the target is uh, CCC and mm -hmm. others that have been used, especially back in the eastern part of the United States and in some foreign countries. And this will stop that, those shoots from growing for a period of several weeks. And it has been used to increase food set and well, conquered back in the United States. And it's also been used in Australia. They report 20 to 30 percent increases. Well, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with that. But what I really wanted to comment from you, since you were in Germany this summer, is any uh, ideas or comments you got on this idea of why they plant them so close together, fertilize them like crazy, make them grow real fast so they can cut the tops off to slow them down. <laughs> well, they top them in France. Uh, anytime you see any sort of a newsreel shot or a, a gourmet photo of a French vineyard or anything, you see them neatly trimmed just like hedges because they've gone through with a, with a uh, what do you call it? Of course, yeah. the theory there, you're, elim you're, you're eliminating the shoot tip, the competition for carbohydrates yeah. in the shoot tip, and it's supposed to go into the fruit. Yeah. Right, it's not found that type of result. But my argument with these people in Europe would be if they wouldn't have to uh, top them so often if they didn't put on so much nitrogen. Reduce. <laughs> huh? Tradition. Yeah, it's tradition. There's the answer. It's tradition. And of course, uh, as I told you once before about something about the French, you can ask them any question you want to about viticulture and ask them if they have any data to back it up. And they say, no, we don't need the data. We know it happens. <laughs> so let's take a break right there and then come back in about 10 minutes or so, okay? Excuse me. You said that you put the nitrogen 